Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank Klaus Sterhofer, um, who invited me here, as did Matthias Erdbeer. I'm very grateful for this invitation, very eager to hear everyone's papers, um, and deeply apologetic that I can't address you in German. Seven years ago, PMLA asked me to write a review article for their theories and methodologies section. My topic was the new formalism. I opened that essay on a note of surprise at the movement's incuriosity about its founding concept, the concept of form itself. Nowhere in the literature did I find references to form from the perspective of performance or disability studies, much less from the richer though more alien fields of systems theory, post-classical physics, cognitive science, and so-called evo-devo theory, standing for evolution and development. In those research sectors, what we call form goes by different names. Closure, for instance, or intentionality, individuation, cognition. I'm not saying that the fit is perfect. What I am saying is that borrowing frameworks from one discipline for use in another, that's a key item in Jonathan Culler's fourfold definition of theory, can be an excellent thing to do. To point my direction, I'll say that the common paradigm among these sectors is self-organization and the common process recursion. That's the connect with lyric form, one of my topics today. The other topic is method, and there too I will be taking a leaf from the sciences, arguing for an epistemic pluralism. Edging out even further on that limb, I will propose an ontic pluralism as well, meaning that we should expect and allow not just different kinds of explanation for different levels of study, but different kinds of objects emerging at different scales and through different techniques of inquiry and display. Some humanities reference points for this claim would be the big data theorists, Barbara Hernstein Smith's radical relativism, and the sociology of science that descends from Bruno Latour. Before going there, though, I need to update my opening observation. The scholarly landscape has changed over the past seven years and changed in ways that would seem to obviate my call for a conceptually new formalism. I'm referring to the upsurge of digital and network theory, animal and eco-study, biopolitics, and so-called object-oriented ontology. Graham Harmon is the name associated with that movement. These new materialisms are the growth industry of our discipline, and they're terrific. But the one thing they haven't yet delivered on is their potential for modeling form and genre. Romanticists will disagree, citing our field's explosion of interest in the life and physical sciences of the period as the exception to that claim about untapped potential. I'm not convinced. My sense of much of this work is that it belongs to the genre of contextual recovery, part of the larger historicist project of undoing our habits of projecting our own disciplinary divides onto earlier discursive fields. That's a great and a crucial thing to do, but I'm talking about something else, namely using those recovered resources to get at logical and formal features of the imaginative literatures of the period. That too is happening, and it started happening with Tim Morton's Ambient Poetics, that's an essay, back in 2001. I'm thinking also of Amanda Goldstein's exploration of form in Goethe, Blake, and Shelley, along the lines of a Lucretian materialism whose currency during the period she conclusively demonstrates. The kind of work I have in mind is similar to this, but occurring at a higher level of generality, the level of poetics. Because the validity of my contribution is tied to its level of analysis, I'll take a minute to scale that level, borrowing first from the schema of critical operations that Color advances to situate his own work on lyric, and second from Franco Moretti's mapping of his work on genre. At one end of the things we do, Color sets literary criticism, which studies particular works and relations. Moretti's counterpart to this temporality is L'Histoire Événementielle, 
a term he borrows from Fernand Braudel, where it describes the time frame at which traditional historiography operates. Roughly, it means the short term, the time defined by events. At the opposite end of the scale, Color puts high theory, which gives, he says, broad accounts of language, sexuality, signification, and so forth. Moretti's equivalent to this time frame, again, he takes it from Prodel, is the famous longue durée. In biological terms, this would correspond to the level of evolutionary or species change, in contrast to developmental, ontogenic, and taxonomic history, terms that describe the temporality of individuals and of classes. I mention this just to add another model to the mix that would be theoretical morphology. Moretti and Color, an odd couple, if ever there was one, set their own work between the extremes of micro and macro analysis. For Moretti, what lives in the middle are genres. I quote, Janus faced, they turn toward history and form, constituting a more rational layer than events, a layer where flow, form and flow meet. For color, theory of the middle range is what used to be called poetics. The middle space, colors, poetics, Moretti's genres, appeals to those who want to, quote, produce something more fundamental than characterization of existing literary modes. I share that desire. Color calls it the crucial theoretical impulse. Where I differ from him is in my turn toward formal models that themselves integrate history. Not, however, in the way of mimesis, in Brodel's idiom, events, and not as ideology or imaginary solutions to real problems, nor as literary history a la color. They took the formal models that I'm talking about, integrate history conceived as routine and runnings, coupling and inaction, terms that I'll describe later on. In other words, I veer toward models that will not tolerate the pernicious polarity between history and form that has dominated debate about lyric for the past five years. Virginia Jackson and Yopi Prinz give the definitive rebuke to that thinking in their Lyric Theory Reader, published last year. Their introduction builds a narrative of both pre- and non-normative 19th century lyric, and their sampling of essays leaves no doubt that the received view of lyric as the genre of inwardness, reflexivity, and reflection represents the victory of just one historical development among many others. For those unfamiliar with the history form binary, I'll take a minute to rehearse it using the highly schematic terms that its participants sadly favor. The debate about lyric pits formalist against historicists, in effect, Aristotelian realists against Baconian nominalists. Color's realism, however, has a structuralist bent. He posits, quote, a set of norms or structural possibilities that underlie and enable particular discursive practices. An abstract model, he calls it, through which different languages and moments in the Western tradition mobilize their distinctive materials. Historical poetics, conversely, argues that different discursive communities attach the name lyric to their own unique practice. When it wants to track intertextuality across groups and eras, historical poetics uses the concept of remediation, which it develops in very powerful ways. My own bias is, and has always been, toward the situated readings, explanatory force, and constructivist notions of form that go with historicist poetics. My own background was in Marxist criticism. At the same time, and here I go back to Color's hallmark of theory, I've always borrowed frameworks from one discipline, for me, political economy, psychoanalysis, pre-modern philosophy, for use in another. In that spirit, I'd like to pitch in on the formalist side right now, not just because I like working on the middle level, but for institutional reasons. Of the two foolishly polarized terms, formalism is the underdog with respect to popularity and prestige, in the States anyway. It's also the more traduced, often through its own self-description. By contrast, historicist poetics needs no defense. It has become our scholarly default and it is eloquent about its ideas and methods. There's another reason to go formalist. In the classroom, as opposed to our monographs and journals, we still presumably teach, or at least talk about, genre, form, and tradition. In other words, some kind of formalism persists, some premising of abstract models and structural possibilities. That being the case, 
we would do well to think about those latent models and how answerable they are to our changed understandings of textuality and individuation. We might also consider how consistent they are with the discipline's topical interests these days, such as affect, ecology, soundscape, the posthuman. Mostly not consistent, I would say. In other words, a case of uneven development between ideas on the one hand and method on the other. Another reason for working on this level, the formalist level, is that an historicist poetics which defines itself over against formalism risks bringing back on a naive empiricism, that is, belief in the possibility of theory-independent and level-neutral description. That belief took a long time and a lot of hard work to banish, and no one wants to have to do it all over again. The positive reason for seizing this plane of inquiry is that by positing a system, actively testing a model or theory, you may get to see things that are only visible under magnification or through certain techniques of display. For instance, you could see inertias and transformations linking seemingly isolated objects and events. You'll want to ask, where exactly are these inertias and transformations, these new things one can see? Are they artifacts of the method generated by the theory level account, the model, or are they in the text? The minute you frame the question that way, answers fly out the window. So you remind yourself that the object you start with, as we say, the reality of the text, is not an unmediated given, but a particular kind of critical object and temporality, an experimental object. Likewise, for forms, models, structures, relations, the instruments of theory. They too are objects, as we know from Latour et al., very complex social objects, not physicalized abstractions. My point here is that instead of privileging one or the other, target or source, text or theory, in either a genetic or a causal way, you set them beside each other and set for each its own critical agenda. Between critical method and critical object, agreement is the rule. It has to be, in that defining the object and determining the method of inquiry are two sides of the same coin, a fact that everything in our training works to conceal. But because of that fact, namely the co-determination of subject, of object and method, there is no rule for non-contradiction among different critical constructs of the same object. Scale invariant applicability is one phrase for this. That's what I meant earlier by tying validity in interpretation to analytic level. No rule for inter-theoretical synonymy is the phrase, ugly but useful, coined by David Hull, a British evolutionary theorist who argues a different kind of explanation at the level of ontogeny from explanations appropriate at the species level. In our idiom, one could entertain a different big data construct of the novel, for instance, from a close reading without having to contrive an encompassing figure to dissolve the contradiction and without having to find a remediable deficit in both. The abstract model I propose is self-assembly, and the critical object I build on it is a particular literary form, lyric poetry, understood as the kind of poem that readers from the 18th century on have recognized as lyric. Certainly this is not the only lyric kind, and it never has been, but as Prinz and Jackson have shown, it's the one that has not only eclipsed many others, but that often stands in for general definitions of literariness per se. This dominance is a historical fact, and it offers itself to a rich variety of explanations that open onto gender, class, and much else. Ultimately, explanations of that kind target questions of fit, historical fit, between writing and reading, medium and mediation, conventions and communities. For students of the middle level, however, students of genre, questions of fit take a different form. Namely, we ask, what is it about certain texts that makes me feel that I'm in the presence of lyric? The question is at once old-fashioned, harking back to reader response rhetorical study and Gadamer's reception theory, and in its friendliness to some very new approaches, a forward-looking form. Lyric comes to mind when one has the impression of thought happening or consciousness occurring. 
I use the participial form to link up with color's central claim about lyric. If narrative is about what happens next, he writes, lyric is about what happens now. He calls this special temporality the lyric present, so familiar as to have gone unnoticed. For instance, Keats, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, or my bungled German version of a famous line from Rilke's archaic torso of Apollo. His torso is suffused with brilliance from inside like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. The content that color assigns to the now is calling, on the one hand a literal statement of vocation, and on the other declaration of the belief that language can make things happen. My content for the now is, as I said, thinking. However, because that statement could easily be assimilated to a number of scripts that I actively rule out, I'll list those first. Thought happening, for me the sine qua non of those forms we describe as lyric, thought happening does not mean, one, someone like an author thinking aloud or on paper. It does not mean, two, representation or staging of thinking, as in dramatic monologue. It does not mean, three, ideas being formulated or arguments made. Neither does it mean for cognition or act of mind in the sense of reflection upon raw percepts or memory data. Finally, and this is important, it does not mean thought to the second power, irony, metatext, self-reflexivity, or theory. Those are five big things that I don't consider necessary or sufficient for feeling myself in the presence of lyric, things that thought happening does not mean. As I use it, the phrase is both very limited and very large. Limited in that it's strictly an operational description and large because in addition to describing human and other animal minds, it covers things that are not typically considered candidates for thought. Things like bacterial colonies, economic recessions, chemical reactions, so-called physical causal systems. As I've said, I want to model lyric as a complex self-organizing system. The mind is such a system described for more than 30 years as an emergent global property of the brain, a thoroughly embodied brain embedded in action routines in the world. In other words, maybe one reason why many of us keep doing what color says we should not, that is conceiving lyric as the performance of someone thinking, is that a process very like thinking does happen in the kind of poem that's been classified as lyric for a long time. Poems that are densely coded, layered, and self-reflexive. Although recursive is the word I prefer to reflexive because its, applica its application goes beyond conventionally defined agents, subjects, and mental states. Self-assembly is a term used by a number of discourses arising in different institutional sectors, some of which I've named. The common tasks researchers in these areas set themselves are first, to explain in non-metaphysical language how certain wholes can be more than and different from the sum of their parts. They ask how certain aggregates generate orderly, directed, and to all appearances intentional behavior out of inanimate or what they call sub-symbolic parts. How does this happen, they ask in the absence of central or even dispersed control mechanisms. You heard the examples of such aggregates, bacterial colonies and traffic jams. Lifelike intention manifests as boundary setting, pattern specifying, and figure ground selection, to name a few examples. It means coordinated whole system action arising directly from rules or arrangements that operate strictly at local levels. A second research goal to explain how the history of certain systems seems spontaneously to select for its own changing ratios of constancy to change, its own boundaries and identity, its own relevant context. It asks how entities bring forth environmental niches out of their buzzing, blooming surround. Here's a soundbite from Esther Thielen and Linda Smith's co-authored a dynamic systems approach to cognition and action. Quote, form emerges in successive interactions, a function of the reactivity of matter 
at many hierarchical levels and of the responsiveness of those levels and those interactions to one another. That excerpt dates back to 1993. In other words, self-organization, actor network theory, society of mind, all these models have been kicking around a long time, both in their home field and as exports to others. The application to literature traces back to 1970s information and systems theory, the landmark event being I.A. Richards' 1963 reissue of his 1926 Science and Poetry, to which he added the essay, How Does a Poem Know When It Is Finished? He also added an afterword titled Reorientation, where he describes, quote, how preternatural, in the sense of beyond our previous notions of the natural, these doings are. And just to give you a benchmark, the doings in 1963 that he referred to were parallel calculators, way back. The line of thought winds through post-structuralist theory and surfaces again in present-day study of hyper and cybertext and interactive media. It's my feeling that the environmental and institutional conditions driving or linked with digital studies give impetus to a broader application of the model of self-assembly. I'll list those conditions now and revisit one later. First, the humanities-wide interest in re-enchanting the object, finding ways to seize the reality of the appearance or the depth of the surface itself. We could try doing this in analytic, not just narrative and descriptive fashion. Two, another way of describing that is the general resurgence of interest in phenomenology, in the States anyway. Two, general acknowledgement of the deep hybridity of the human vis-a-vis -vis other species, technology, and the built world, borrowing from Sarah Ahmed, our queer phenomenology. Three, the newly palpable reality of a variety of global or total conditions and behaviors, flows of labor, populations, goods, credit, et cetera, and along with that, obviously, new awareness of worldwide climate change and environmental crisis. There is a difference between conditions that are analytically available as these were certainly 10, maybe even 20 years ago, and conditions that are lived as if they are unmediated. Every time we post our course materials online by a low energy light bulb or a non-phosphate detergent, each time we debate the future of English departments versus world literatures in English, we feel our connexities Richard's nonce word for the new kinds of connections explored by the sciences and poetries of his day. Feeling these connexities, we should also feel our lack of concepts for the kinds of wholeness they compose. I should add here that David Bohm, a British physicist, is also an important resource for thinking about these new totalities. A fourth factor encouraging extension of the self-assembly model occurs at the level of politics. I mean the clear failure of robust autonomy claims for the individual, of determination claims for the economic, and of mediation claims for ideological structures and institutions. What I'm referencing, I think you know, are web-based technologies that extend the individual and the collective deep inside each other, squeezing out those mediations that in the old days both linked and distinguished those two spheres of analysis and activity. Two examples, instantaneously registered financial transactions and social network politics. What I'm saying is that within the special conditions of the present, self-organization, which wrestles with the strange causalities arising in dynamically nested parts and wholes, is a model worth our attention. Evolutionary biologist Richard Lewontin has been named one of the few who's thought about his discipline in terms of organizing metaphors. As early as 1985, he rejected the model of the organism familiar to those who study 19th century poetry, namely the one deriving from Coleridge's posit of organic form, which traces to Goethe. On that view, suitably updated, the organism is a metabolic input-output model, the identity or integrity of which is genetically determined in the short run or for individual organisms. In the long run, identity is subject to evolutionary change by the interlocked processes of random variation, adaptation, and natural selection. On that view, the traditional and so-called alienated view, says Lewontin, quote, environments have autonomous sets of laws, and organisms discover them, meet them, and cope with them, 
In place of this, Lewontin describes a dynamic systems relation between entity and environment. He calls it an anti-environmentalist view of nature. I quote, just as there are no entities without environments, so there are no environments without entities. You have to sit with that claim for a second to feel its force. The first part is easy. That is how entities require and even include their environments. Metabolism, for instance, counts as inclusion. But the other bit, saying environments don't exist without entities when environment includes rocks and stones or the inanimate orders of things, as it does for Lewontin and most eco-theorists, well, that claim entails a radical ontological reciprocity that startles all our intuitions, way more than the old brain teaser about trees falling in forests with no one around to hear. Self-organization is the umbrella term for all these phenomena wherein the boundaries of the system are not given in advance, but are rather specified or enacted, where what counts as inside or out at any given moment depends on the state of the system as a whole at that moment. Two Chilean neurobiologists, Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana, are the earliest um, kind of theorists of self-organization in biology. In our line of work, literature, boundaries can take the form of text context perceptions. Ask yourself how you decide what counts as context for a given work, a given critical exercise, a given cultural or institutional moment. Then ask if it's you doing the deciding or the state of the system as a whole, the system being the scholarly publishing industry, the academy, your particular subfield, and the character and reach of its databases. Here's an example of self-assembly or entity environment co-creation. Today's neuroscience standardly models the brain not by reference to its functionally dedicated anatomical structures, visual cortex, for instance, but as a system of widely distributed neuron groups, clusters of neurons that are capable of grouping. Under conditions provided by both internal and external stimuli, clearly the analogy here is to the lyric poem, under conditions provided by both internal and external stimuli, and crucially by the history of the system, which is also the history of the body and thus of the person, think the history of the poem and of its readings. Under these conditions, these physically uncoordinated clusters will fire together. The determining role of the system's history is explained by a mechanism called Hebb's law. Quote, neurons that fire together wire together. They do so because of reinforcement effects that occur with repetition. More interesting because brain connections are so dense and operation levels so nested, a description with special application to textual systems and poetry more than the rest. Because of that, these feedback effects don't just reinforce the original state and workings of the network, they introduce changes into it. I don't mean content or input changes, as in laying down new memories, but rather wiring changes, in our parlance, formal changes. The system's activity patterns have a recursive effect. They reconfigure the system's boundaries, meaning that some neuron clusters will join in the system and others will drop out. In other words, the system effectively selects for its own boundary relations and thus its own identity at any given moment, and it does so as an effect of its own history, its operation in time with all the variables introduced by time. The history of the system literally brings that system's components into being and continually modifies them. In other words, the system learns. Colloquially, we learn. What you hear in all this is a strong rejection of the qualitative uniqueness of the organic. The life sciences draw on and mesh with the physical and so-called exact sciences, as well as with science and technology studies. In other words, contemporary biology actively dismantles the kinds of organic mechanic distinctions on which Coleridge's metaphors rested. Or maybe Coleridge's organicism is the anachronistic projection of early 20th century criticism informed by that moment's normal science. The passage from local rules to global organization, you'll forgive me, this is a little technical, but it's worth hearing, I think. It's more worth reading than hearing, but bear with me. The passage from local rules to global organization is the heart of self-assembly and it's predicated on a certain kind of part, 
on the existence of parallel levels that are very densely linked, and on the recursive process I just described. First, parts. The correct word in this idiom is regime, process structure, or activity pattern, even rhythm, terms that were invented to rule out fixed spatio-temporal units. These process structures originate with the application of simple local rules and come to define different levels or codes where information is defined following Gregory Bateson as a difference that makes a difference and is thus always linked to performance. The transition from structures to codes occurs via cascading feedback. The operation of the whole over time brings into being the structures explaining that operation. It also explains how orderly behavior arises from aggregates with no central mechanisms for control. As I said, recursion is one name for this phenomenon. Another, Douglas Hofstadter's, is strange loops. Our term in literature studies, back formation, is also a good synonym, as is Louis Althusser's notion of absent cause, derived from Spinoza, a cause which is imminent only in its effects, or, as Althusser also says, the effectivity of the whole in the part. Though recursion looks a lot like mise en abîme, there's one crucial difference. With the latter, picture the drosty chocolate girl, the only changes introduced into the self-replicating original are those of scale. Though mise en abîme seems to spiral up or down, in or out, it goes nowhere. With recursion, however, the repeats introduce changes into the generative machinery itself. It would be as if the drosty girl were smiling in one frame and frowning in another. This happens because recursive systems are open to the environment. That's what defines them, their drawing and redrawing of the bounding line. The logic is evolutionary, not circular. Changing, not homeostatic. And changing, I don't mean becoming, in that internally driven and directed Hegelian sense. More technical material, which I'm going to skip. Another crucial feature of self-organizing systems is their nonlinearity, which means that very small changes at one level can yield large outcomes at another. Which small changes will register and how small they may be cannot be formalized or predicted. As before, those decisions, so to speak, depend on the history of the system. Here, an analogy might be to natural selection and a phenomenon called pre-adaptation. Random variations produce opportunities and disadvantages that get activated or not, depending on factors that only become factors and on a field that only crystallizes as a field after the fact. After the organism as a whole, we might say, has motivated the condition. We all know how tiny variations can produce huge outcomes in evolutionary development, and certainly many of us here are much more familiar with how this happens in poems. Poems in context, context in poems, and poems treated as autonomous. We also know how hard it is explaining this to students in analytic or linear terms. What do self-organizing systems do, you would ask? Their raison d'etre. The answer is they make changes in themselves and they do it strictly as a result of their own situated workings. That's the one and the defining thing they do. Everything else, in literature terms, they lay bare the workings of ideology, affirm the status quo, release new affective potentials, enhance perception, renew the language, etc. In non-aesthetic non terms, switch from conduction to convection, create vortices out of turbulence, cause deflationary spirals, all of these actions follow from that one rule of self-modification. You might say that the countless purposes served by systems of this kind, countless even for any one system, are byproducts of their internal purposiveness. If you could get Kant's aesthetic and Bourdieu's habitus to do a duet, that is the tune they would sing. Where's the intersection with lyric? In Radiant Textuality, Jerome McGann calls poetry the most densely coded of the genres. I take this to mean that every action potential of the poem, or of the text we call poems, and especially those received as lyric, every single one can become a feature, every feature an element in a pattern, and every pattern an organizing principle. 
I say especially true of lyric because poems so designated tend to be those which suspend the closures imposed by narrative, dramatic, and doctrinal structuring. That means that any and every structuring possibility remains alive. No feature becomes extra systemic until its polysystemic possibilities have been exhausted, which is never. The formation of these patterns, acoustic, iconic, figurative, etc., occurs through the application of very simple local rules. Here's one, alliteration. Where does the rule for it come from? The rule that says alliteration is an informational code and thus each instance of it a meaningful feature. Not from the fact that two words or even 10 start with the same letter, but from the global performance of the poem as a whole, which either circles back or doesn't to target alliterative events as events, elements in a system, information, not noise. You hear the circularity, the hermeneutic circularity to be exact, how to determine the poem's parts till you've identified the whole, but how to do that until you've figured out the parts. Rather than seeing this as a metaphysical mystery testifying to the uniqueness and glory of poetry, or as a reader response projection, or as a handicap to formal explanation, we can see it as a, a property that poetry shares with hugely disparate phenomena. We can then study those phenomena to illuminate the poetry phenomenon. That alone should justify not just modeling lyric, but modeling it in this way. I'll go back to the dense coding specific to poetry because it suggests another point of comparison between lyric and other self-organizing ensembles. The connection within lyric levels can jump levels, exhibiting that non-linear behavior I mentioned where small differences yield mighty results. So for example, a collateral intertextual resonance, say a muted Miltonic phrasing in a poem that seems not to need it or to heed it, can leap to semantic prominence under certain global conditions which are also always historical conditions. I like the way this tipping point effect chimes with Jakobsen's famous description of the poetic function as, quote, a projection of the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection onto the axis of combination. I take that to mean that a contingent similarity relationship, for instance, A is like B, love is in some respect like a rose, jumps to a semantic level a goes with B, love and roses are part of the same entity, or one is an attribute or part of the other. In other words, I'm describing a level jump from metaphor, the level of arbitrary signification, to metonymy, the onto level of reference or mimesis. In this way, intention arises from non-intentional processes, much as information arises from noise under certain conditions. Obviously, there are important differences between knowledge-based systems like poems and physical causal ones like vortices. Though both project an agency effect, our inclusion in the poetic effect is a distinctive feature. I'll try getting at this by way of cognitive philosopher Andy Clark, chair of logic and metaphysics at the University of Edinburgh and author of most recently, Supersizing the Mind, Cognition, Embodiment, Action. Clark launches a model of thinking that he calls extended, as opposed to the conventional view, which he calls brain-bound. In brain-bound, all thinking happens in the biological brain, which has entry channels at the perceptual interface, where world meets and pinches on body, and exit channels at the action interface, where body goes forth into or meets world. By contrast, extended, quote, depends directly, non-instrumentally, on the ongoing work of the body and or extra-organismic environment. End quote. He says non-instrumentally to distinguish his model, one of radical incorporation from tool use. Extended minds, he writes, and we all have them, are natural born cyborgs. They do engage in standardly described representing and computing, but some of our thinking, some of the time, supervenes upon activities and encodings that promiscuously crisscross brain, body, and world. When we think in this way, we're testing the possibilities for incorporating new resources deep into our embodied problem-solving routines. Thinking thus, not as a discrete event performed by a subject on an object 
mental or otherwise, but a process of self-assembly in which embodied agents exploit opportunities provided by active sensing, dynamic loops, and repeated bouts of environmental exploitation and intervention. Seeing the mind in this way means seeing minds and bodies as subject to radical restructuring in which new equipment can become incorporated into the thinking and acting that we identify with our minds and bodies. The meaningful time span is that of the lifetime, not the scale of evolutionary change. To give you an example, the test for truly extended cognition, as distinct from tool use, is Clark's so-called parity principle. If, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which, were it to go on in the head, we'd have no trouble accepting as part of the cognitive process, then that part of the world is, for that period of time, part of the cognitive process. Example, when I was little, I added and subtracted by drawing the sides of a dice using grouping and comparing techniques that now take place in my head. Small confession, what's really in my head is the image of the dice. In other words, I still add and subtract a bit like a cyborg. Obviously, the argument isn't that pencil and paper are cognitive, only that body and world involving loops are part of an extended action that traditional bioprejudices have kept us from seeing. Clark is quick to observe that language has always been a prime example of extended minds, a technological scaffolding allowing us to simplify complex tasks, achieve higher levels of computational ex expertise, and add new objects to the world, such as words and categories. Clark says we're always testing the possibilities for incorporating new resources into our embodied problem-solving routines. For many of us in this room, the resource of poetry in general maybe Lyric in particular, has met the test for incorporation. The evidence, back to color. He says, Lyric is memorable language with the power to embed bits of language in your mind, to invade and occupy it. The force of poetry is to get it self-remembered. Many of the reasons for this are formal in the old-fashioned sense or the conventional sense. Color cites rhythmical shaping, phonological patterning. But a better term for the kinds of reasons I've been looking at is formational pointing to a process, not a result. What's formational is the dense coding unique to poetic language use, the incidence of parallel processing, the frequency of level crossing and jumping. Putting that all into English, formal features are always getting taken up into semantics, the diegetic always deforming and displacing the mimetic, the working machinery of the poem altering with its own running, and the end altering the beginning. What I'm saying is that poetic organization of language approximates and joins in on brain work. The two are isomorphic. I then spend a bit of time distinguishing this model from organicism, structuralism, and traditional formalism. I've introduced a lot of expensive equipment, lab equipment. What's the gain for lyric? As the philosophers like to say, how to pay for it. I'll explain first the gain to me personally, maybe to others who teach and study poetry, especially romantic poetry. The broadest, simplest definition of lyric, good for a first year course and setting aside the older sense of lyric as song, might go as follows. A lyric poem is a representation of the experience of thinking and feeling, or anal analogies, remembering, wishing, hating, etc. Lyric both enacts thinking and feeling and includes in the performance reflection on those processes, creating a spiral effect which seems to climb toward ever more encompassing self-accounting. The general term for this effect is self-reflexivity or the mind's return upon itself. The more specialized term is irony, more specialized yet, romantic irony. Later in the semester, You'll want to explain to your students that the hallmark of lyric, its representation of inwardness, occurs with the splitting of narrative, the story that is told, or what Russian formalism used to call fabula, from narration, the story of the telling, or sujet. This split triggers a chain reaction, cleaving grammar from argument, form from content, necessity from contingency. Collectively, these divisions reinforce the philosophical and psychological split in the subject, separating the reflecting mind from the object of its scrutiny, 
you tell your students that the aim of the poem is to reunite those domains, turning the dialogue of self and soul into a complex interior monologue. Your students ask, why should the mere fact of representation instigate this cascading fission? One answer is language. With the positing of the I, first person singular, objectification of a strictly processual inwardness, lyric allegorizes our fall into language. And within its own small compass makes it happen all over again. Along similar lines, you might explain the workings of le supplement, and Deridian Difference. Answers of that kind, grammatology, are probably the only precise ones, though they tend to fall flat in the classroom and even to your own ears. One wants to give a substantive explanation, or at least one that's closer to the particulars of lyric. When I yield to that impulse, I find myself stuck in one of two boxes, cued by the romantic lyrics structural troping of Christianity's fall to rise, its fortunate fall, and by that story's susceptibility to Hegelian and Marxist recoding, what I mean here is self-enriching alienation, I answer that question teleologically. Why, and I might quite quote Coleridge here, does the subject make itself subject by constructing itself objectively to itself? You're German, this language must be familiar to you, <laughs> this Hegelian kind of clotted language. In a different key, why does God, bright essence, emanate Christ, his effluence? That's a line from Milton from Paradise Lost. Or again, why does Geist divide into mind and, and nature? Answer, so that humanity may find and fulfill its project to reunite spirit with matter adding the dividend of absolute self-consciousness, more narrowly so that the reader of lyric may undergo this process of bildung. The payoff is the birth of thought about thought, which, while it forever blocks the Eastern Gate, the portal back to innocence or self-identity, at the same time establishes the subject's power to mediate all subsequent unities. It opens the westward passage, masterful and melancholy, effective and ethical, the Enlightenment subject is born. That's one box. Here's the other. Your best or most cynical students will see how self-serving your explanation is, how it glorifies that critical itch we all feel, that itch to murder, to dissect from Wordsworth, and thus redeem and resurrect. These students will demand a real explanation, not a just-so story for the scission which launches modern lyric. They'll ask, why that initial posit, that over-against? They'll ask where that Christian Hegelian perspective comes from, or what motivates that enlightenment and romantic tarrying with the negative. Because they grasp the subject-object, mind-nature paradigm as part of the problem, you'll then set your account in the domain of the body. So you might suggest that the founding and maybe not so fortunate fall occurs in the domain of production, the laboring body, or the domain of desire, the Freudian or Deleuzian body, or the domain of power, the Foucauldian body, or the domain of race and gender, marked versus unmarked bodies, or of empire, or more inclusively, of trauma. At a certain point, you'll realize that you're saying, in the domain of turtles, standing on other turtles. Here's the problem. On the one hand, one wants to stop offering explanation in the same terms as what we're trying to explain. That is, in terms of features essential to our experience of ourselves as believing, wishing, intending creatures. On the other hand, why must the closure of the artwork be modeled through a posit of exteriority, as in politics, economy, sociality, materiality? All of these variants of Frederick Jameson's synonym for history, i.e., what hurts, itself a spin-off from Althusser's, quote, 
what resists symbolization absolutely, which Althusser called the real, capital R. For many of us today, the desideratum is an imminent form of explanation, not a translation of our analytic object, but an unfolding, explication, of a pattern pleated into it, a pattern that repeats across other domains, scales, and states, which we may call context or history, but not the outside or the other. Anyone familiar with today's scholarship knows that we have, in fact, developed many ways of embodying this kind of explanation, this kind of understanding. That's probably why students and non-academics find our explanations so maddening. That feedback loop between figure and ground, text and context, and the resistance to privileging either domain, or consider today's so-called intersectional studies, which construct their object of inquiry not in the between of various domains, but as the between. I characterize these features, however, as procedural and stylistic and embedded in the critical practice. In my experience, this makes such understanding not just hard to teach, maybe even impossible, but hard to defend critically. What we could use are models that are large enough to help others learn from our practice, and maybe more important, explicit enough to be studied and developed in their own right. Self-assembly, the inactive sciences, complexity study, and the like cast the continuous production of form or selfhood and the simultaneous production of context or domain of significance as a kind of positing. The meaningful feature, however, of this kind of positing is that it happens without the over against that for many of us defines representation. Its affinities are rather with Coleridge's formula. This is from the Biographia Literaria. Coleridge's formula for the primary imagination, and I quote, this is a dense slogan, repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am in isolation. The key word there is repetition, which suggests extension, addition, coupling, in Coleridge's phrase, eddying, but not cutting, negating, or canceling. No aufhebung. It means starting from where you are, which means losing the metaphysical, or maybe gaining it by losing what we thought of as the merely physical. Self-organization offers a rigorously non-dualistic and imminent history of becoming, which realizes one goal of dialectical thinking, namely to demonstrate the identity of identity and difference. Unlike dialectics, however, it does so without an initial act of curtailment, whereby the entropic plenitude of existence crystallizes into determinate form. In losing that fiat, it also loses the leftovers, the remainder. Self-organization offers a fresh perspective on the hoary concept of aesthetic autonomy redefining both the nomos, or law, that the artwork gives itself, and the self thus regulated. It lets us keep or bring back a model of poetic form while dissociating it from structure and intention. Or perhaps its model of intention amplifies the so-called achieved intention of 1950s neo-Aristotelians, Richard McKeon, R.S. Crane, and Elder Olson, the so-called Chicago School. Another way to pay for this costly equipment might be the research opportunities we could do with disciplines not often part of our circle, opportunities that you've already taken advantage of here. As for pedagogy more generally, why not show students it isn't just poetry that's conceptually hard or non or para-rational, what our students in the States call subjective, disparagingly, meaning not lending itself to definitive formulation and lacking strict subject-object boundaries. I think it's great for students to see that both the objects and the explanatory models of the sciences are as fluid, as polydeterminative, and as comfortable as with history and contingencies as are ours in the humanities. Daniel Tiffany observes that you can learn things by making models that you cannot learn from either the blueprint or from empirical examples. 
He's especially interested in models of, quote, phenomena that are by their nature inscrutable, like those in physics, math, and poetry. He explores modeling, he calls it toy making, as doing, not in the sense of applying knowledge, nor in the sense of conveying knowledge or clarifying, as would be the case in analogy, but rather as generating knowledge. In the same vein, Hofstadter defines models not as evidence-generating machines, but as discovery apparatuses. He says they're like metaphors, but where you don't know the relation between the two domains in advance. As for formalism, we know its traditional meaning, a view of the work as autonomous with respect to its founding conditions, as well as its conditions of reception and everything in between. What I've been describing, self-organization, could be termed a formalism in that, as I said, its claims are operational, which means formal, though in a highly dynamic sense. The dynamism, I would emphasize, is all. On this view, the work is a system that comes into being at certain threshold states or under threshold conditions, and it comes into a different kind of being, or it fails to materialize at all under other conditions. These conditions don't belong to history or to the text or to the reader, but to shifting and analyzable configurations of all three, among others. Among scientists, formalism means believing in the usefulness of devising logical models, forms, or formulas. They're useful because they, quote, provide reliable means of taking phenomena which arise from and reflect contingent, particular relations and translating them into a form that isolates what's necessary from an intentional point of view, from the as if it were an agent or an action or a person point of view, which is to say from the lyric point of view. Thank you very much. <laughs>